Did you know that we're actually living in the safest times in human history? At least for first world countries, this is absolutely true. So why is it that you and many people maybe feel a subtle unease when living life? A tapping noise of anxiety is happening in the background in your day to day. It's almost like our society is scared. Oh wait, it is. So how is it possible to be living in the safest times in human history yet at the same exact time be so scared? This is Barry Glasner, and he said a very profound quote that I really like. Quote, we are living in the most fear-mongering time in human history. And the main reason for this is that there's a lot of power and money available to individuals and organizations who can perpetuate these fears. Bingo. Man, fear and anxiety. This is going to be a very important video when it comes to understanding how society programs us using fear and anxiety against us, basically prehistoric emotions that we've used for survival for such a long time. And now it's used in different domains like politics, marketing, and education to get people to act a certain way. So I'm gonna cover at least five domains of life where this is present and also what happens in the body when it comes to fear. How does the mind react to fear? How does the body react to fear? And of course, we're gonna talk about what you can do about these things that go on. From a base survival standpoint, the mind scans the environment for threats. Like what could potentially kill me basically in the environment? And fear arises, it's an emotion that we feel to alert us to either fight the threat or run away from the threat. and. When we do this, the thinking mind shuts down. The body prioritizes thinking a lot less and it prioritizes survival more. And think about it, when you can get people to think less rationally because they're in fear, you can get them to go with any cause or belief system you want them to, right? Because you can position your belief system as a way of getting away from what they're scared of. So for example, politician that wants to get elected, he's not gonna necessarily just talk about the things he wants to do for the people that support his party. Sure, that's nice. But that's not gonna really persuade people at a primal level. What's gonna really persuade you at a primal level is talking about the things you fear most. So if you fear, for example, people taking your jobs, if the politician wants to get elected, he's gonna talk about that a lot. They're gonna steal your jobs. Your brain reacts to that like, oh, they're gonna steal our jobs. We don't want, I don't want that. How do I prevent that? Oh, I just have to make sure this guy's elected. The fear persuaded you way better than any positive benefit ever could. Humans like to avoid pain more than move towards pleasure. Always remember that. Here's a quote I really like on this. Quote, if you look at the cellular level of the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, the thinking and memory forming parts of the brain, when you're living under constant states of fear and anxiety, you can actually see them shutting down. They shrink, they wither, and the amygdala actually gets bigger. Our rational thinking mind starts to not be as optimal because the body's prioritizing survival, right? And the fear emotion perpetuates us taking some sort of action. And here's a quote on what I just said that I really like. Fear prepares us to react to danger. Once we sense a potential danger, our bodies release hormones that slow or shut down functions not needed for survival, sharpen functions that might help us survive such as eyesight heart rate increases and blood flows to muscles so we can run faster so you can see how base level and animalistic things can get when someone lives in a perpetual fear mode when anxiety and fear is something they constantly see and consume in their lives the decisions they make are are driven by that the body is viewing it this as okay i need to make decisions now that prioritize my survival because i'm in in threat right now because i'm perceiving things as fears and threats where is this perception coming from for example you're watching the news it's only perpetuating negativity how is your worldview of the world gonna be it's a dangerous place right so you don't have time for emotions that are high in a higher vibration like joy gratitude and contentment because you're at a baseline reptilian survival emotion here's another quote for mass media insurance companies big pharma advocacy groups lawyers politicians and so many more your fear is worth billions and fortunately for them your fear is also very easy to manipulate we're wired to respond to it above everything else. If we miss an opportunity for abundance, life goes on. But if we miss an important fear cue, it doesn't. So this is powerful right here. When we talk about living a better life, right, you want to experience high vibration emotions that are in alignment with a great life, right? Like I said, emotions like joy, for example. But in order to have emotions like joy, you need to perceive your environment as being safe. So when your environment is safe, now you can easily create the things that you want in your life. It's easier. I'm not saying you can't if it's unsafe but it's easier if it is now we have a negativity bias as in we watch for threats because if we don't notice the threat 
we're not going to be alive to even live the amazing life that we want, right? So it makes a lot of sense. But the problem here is that these societal infrastructures, politicians, big pharma, these domains of society prioritize financial gain over your ability to live by high vibration emotions. They don't care about that. That's none of their business. They care about monetary, tangible things like profit, bigger customer bases, etc. So it would make sense that if they don't have your best interest at heart, then you need to be more responsible for the emotions that you feel. So that means you need to watch what you consume. You need to watch the things that they feed you. You have to question things like that. And I'm gonna get more into that later in this video. Quote, the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn it's not something that's supposed to make you happy all the time. It's mostly a stress reactive machine. Its primary job is to keep us alive, which is why it's so easy to flip people into fear all the time. So now I'm gonna get into the different parts of the brain. I'm gonna just keep this very baseline and uh, simple. So you have the reptilian brain, which I mentioned deals with um, mainly survival and also bodily processes as well. Next you have the limbic brain, which deals with your emotional centers, right? Hippocampus, things like that. And then you have the neocortex, which deals with your ration rationality, things like abstract thinking, cognition, etc. Let's focus on the emotional centers, mainly the amygdala. The triangle of neurons on the amygdala parses through stimuli coming in from the outside world, looking for, and among other things, threats. If it senses danger, then the neurons start firing, signaling that the central amygdala to activate a defense response to the body. This whole process is an unconscious physiological response, perspiration, increased heart rate, shortness of breath. So that's what it looks like bodily wise when it comes to fear. Now, a quick distinction between fear and anxiety is that fear is something that you are experiencing that's present or it's very close to happening and you're extremely certain. Anxiety is a feeling that you're anticipating something to happen, but it's not present at all. It's more so something coming from the mind. Now let's look at areas where fear and anxiety is used mainly against you to uh, go for certain agendas or to act certain ways that are in the best interest of certain societal domains or infrastructures. First, the news. The news prioritizes viewership, of course. And a lot of times people focus on things that are negative because the brain is looking to survive. It's scanning for threats. So if it's noticing something that's a threat, it's going to pay attention to it. Okay, what can I do about this thing that that's happening in the news right now? Is this a direct threat to me? Is it not? Let me be on alert. Now, I'm not saying to not stay up to date on things, you should, but what things actually matter and what things actually don't, that's a very important distinction here. Because you can get lost in the sauce when it comes to things that don't matter and things that are just sensationalized to get your attention, to get people talking. We live in an attention economy. If you have people's attention, that can be very lucrative. Here's a quote, propagandists work under the assumption that people eventually believe what they hear most often. The constant hyping of a culture of fear has rhetorically scared otherwise reasonable people into irrational emotions and behaviors. What's repeated most often has a profound impact on the psyche. So it's twofold. You have repetition, which is a, a method used to, to program your subconscious mind, right? When you repeat things over and over again. B, emotion, repetition and emotion, the emotion of fear. So you have repetition and fear combined together can program you. This is powerful stuff. When we look at what media we take in, not just the news, but I'm talking social media, I'm talking television shows. Next, politics. I touched on that just briefly. Politicians use fear in order to gain your votes, if votes even count. They use this as a way of galvanizing people towards a certain cause, right? Towards a certain way of thinking. And when you can galvanize people under an, not just a way of thinking, but an emotion, they feel closer together and they feel more against the opposition. That's how it's used in politics. Quote, we regress to tribalism when afraid. This is an evolutionary advantage that would lead to the group cohesion and help us fight the other tribe to survival. Tribalism is the biological loophole that many politicians have banked on for a long time. Tapping into our fears and tribal instincts. Some examples are Nazism, the Ku Klux Klan, religious wars in the dark ages. In my video for ego defense mechanisms you're not seeing, I talked about splitting, the ability to not see nuance in an argument. This is the bread and butter of a lot of political movements. It's us versus them, 
We don't need to see their their side because they're wrong, they're evil, we're the right people, we're fighting for good, basically. Next, education. There's a lot of career fear um, when it comes to education. Education pushes career fear. If you don't get this degree, you won't be successful. If you don't go to this school, you won't be successful. If you don't get this credential, you won't be successful. A lot of this is, is bogus. Sure, are there examples of people getting certain accolades and degrees and having successful careers? Yes, there are. There's a lot of proof for that. Is there proof of people getting certain degrees and accolades and not being successful? Yeah, there's a lot of proof for that. Are there people not getting any degrees and accolades and being successful? Yeah, there's proof for that. Is there evidence of people not getting get, not getting accolades and not being successful? Absolutely. There's no linear path for career growth. There are people that start from one career and they go to another, right? Because they just learn the skill sets. So there's a million ways to skin a cat. When it comes to your career, don't buy into the fear around, like let's say you're in college or something, or let's say you're just in a career. Don't buy into the fear that you can't transition to something new just because other people believe that they can't do it so they think you can't you can't do it or it hasn't quote unquote been done before in your family etc because it all comes down to our beliefs if we believe something to be true we're going to act in ways that show it but if we can look at opposing arguments that goes a long way and this is very lucrative for things like universities right like they can convince you that they're the one path to move forward <laughs> it's not the case did i go to youtube university to have a youtube channel and to help a lot of people and there's psychology and, and spiritual growth no because youtube university doesn't exist but did i learn psychology and learn the ins and outs of it self-study and of course i took some classes in college cool but most of my knowledge comes from self-study right and my self-experiences and a real world application which makes my videos so effective humbly so this is this is the thing with education right when it comes to how fear fear and anxieties are used to get you to buy that textbook to go to that school to join that fraternity etc you have to watch that and be very aware of how it's used uh to have you do certain actions next uh religion of course right fears of where you'll be in the afterlife based off your this, your your behavior here um you want to watch this as well be free to question it. Is there a part of your psyche that questions this belief that if you act good in the 3D realm throughout your whole life, that you will go to a certain positive destination, or if you act bad in your 3D life, you will go to a negative destination after. You wanna question this. How is your fear used, right? And is, is something like religion even holding you back? Are you living a fraction of a life because a religion told you that if you do this, it's wrong? And also look at evidence that people doing this thing that's wrong actually turn out to live a great life. So that's very important. Next, marketing and sales. Companies really prey on FOMO, fear of missing out, um, scarcity, urgency, basically fear-based thinking in order to get you to buy things now, et cetera, et cetera. I would know because I own a marketing business and I don't use these tactics because I don't agree with them, but I see them. Same with sales, right? Like. You go to a place and the sales guy comes up to you and he's like, oh, like we only have this last thing left. Like, can you, you want to get it now? Cause we're going to be out next week. And you come back next week and they have like a whole shelf of it left. <laughs> That's another thing you want to be mindful of. Uh, relationships too, right? Relationship fears, your beliefs around how relationships are, uh, your ability to get into a great relationship or have the unique type of relationship you want to have. Society can tell you that a relationship is like this, but it turns out that this way that it tells you how it is, is actually not even healthy, right? There are people that literally believe that arguing consistently is a healthy relationship. Uh, I don't think it is at all. I think that's stupid. I think disagreements are common. And I think there are different ways of going through dis disagreements, right? You can cordially talk about why you think you're right. And the other person can cordially talk about why you, why they think they're right. And you can be firm about how you, how you talk, but arguing all the time being uh, a healthy relationship or showing a sign of a healthy relationship. I think that's bogus. So we want to question that as well. So let's talk about what you can do about all of this. First, watch what you consume. The subconscious mind, it doesn't care about truth per se. It cares about what's repeated and the repeated habits and actions you do. So you have to be hyper aware of where you put your consciousness. Is it social media? Okay, what kind of content do you consume? How often are you on it? And are you using it as basically, you know, a crutch for things you don't want to face? So we want to look at what we consume. And this is easier said than done, but I always go by the rule of make sure you're consuming more good things for your mind than bad things for your mind. I know there's the bubblegum entertainment that we all like to watch, right? I freaking love like ignorant rap music. 
I just love it from time to time. While I'm driving, I'm just having fun, enjoying, rapping along, I love it. But I understand that I'm not gonna consume that all the time, right? Cause it's, 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 it's dumb and ignorant, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna still have things that, that, that stimulate my mind for the better. Uh, next, learn about your psychology, right? Not just your psychology and the mental processes of how you work, but also the higher realms of human potential. It's not just psychology, but it's okay, how does the body affect the mind? How can I manifest the things that, that I want? What about frequencies? How can I think in a high vibration frequency that is in alignment with things I value, et cetera, right? Whether it's a person, right? Whether it's a, a, a possession. And you wanna be also careful with this, right? It's not just all about desires and material things. You wanna do an analysis of, is this something I actually want or is this something that I was pushed to want? So for example, you want a big house. Do you actually want a big house in this certain state or country? Or were you told to get that big house in this certain state or country? When we look at the higher realms of human potential, when we practice meditation, when we learn about the law of assumption, when we learn about universal laws, we want to think about, okay, I want this thing, but is this something that's actually going to fulfill me? Or is this something that I was told I should want? Um, next, actively take responsibility for everything in your life, your emotions, Sure, we have all of these things going on in society that are bringing out certain emotions in us, but at the end of the day, it's coming from us. So it's our responsibility to be careful what we're consuming and then focus on the emotions that we want and the emotions that are in correlation to a great life. Make sure we're staying up in the higher uh, vibration emotions and not beating ourselves up for being in lower vibration emotions. In Stoicism, there's a topic of temperance where you're okay with both sides of things. You're kind of in the middle. So although we prefer the higher vibration emotions, get, when we experience the lower ones, we implement temperance to be okay with that and then get back to where we wanna be. So take responsibility for your life all the way through and you won't blame so much much society for how you are. We're at the cause of how our lives turn out for the most part. Uh, lastly, ask more questions, right? Question things. When things come up, when you consume certain things, when society tells you to be a certain way, question it. Why should you be that way? Look at opposing arguments. Play devil's advocate sometimes. Even things you believe in, play devil's advocate. When you implement these types of things, you start to look at fear differently. You start viewing it as something that, okay, from a survival standpoint, it has helped us for such a long time. And now it's being used to get me to act a certain way. So I need to be aware of how society is using fear to get me to act a certain way.